Hello everyone. In today's video, we will be learning about the postnatal growth of mandible. It has been established and in accordance with the cephalocaudal gradient of growth, the mandible undergoes the largest amount and the longest period of postnatal growth. The mandible moves in a downward and forward direction. The mandible at the time of birth is separated in middle by symphysal cartilage which is ultimately replaced by bone between 4 months to 1 year of age. So there is minimal condylar development at this age with almost absent articular eminence and short mandibular ramus. So although mandible is a large single bone but it can be divided functionally and developmentally into several subunits that is the ramus, body, angle, alveolar process, chin and the condyle and the coronoid processes. So Scott divides the mandible into three portions that is the basal, muscular and alveolus. So the basal portion refers to the tube like central foundation from the condyle to the symphysis whereas the muscular portion which includes the gonial angle and the coronoid process is under the influence of the masticatory muscles. So the muscle function determines the ultimate form of the mandible in these areas. And third is the alveolar bone which exists to hold the teeth. So when the teeth are lost there is no further use for the alveolar bone and it is gradually resorbed Before we get into the details of several subunits it is important for us to know the difference between the interstitial and appositional type of growth So interstitial means from within from inside so the chondrocytes divide and secrete matrix after which the cartilage is replaced by bone leading to lengthening of the bone whereas appositional growth means adding on the surface which leads to deposition of new bone on the pre-existing one resulting in thicker bones as you can see in this schematic diagram heavy appositional growth occurs on the posterior border of ramus along with resorption on the anterior border so this maintains the anterior posterior dimension of the ramus during growth and also ultimately lengthens the mandibular body in order to accommodate the erupting molars the growing pharyngeal spaces and increased bulk of the masticatory muscles if we were to make a vertical section through the posterior ramus and the coronoid region it would show a characteristic growth pattern which involves periosteal deposition on the lingual surface and removal from the buccal surface in the superior portion as opposed to the basal part of the ramus with opposite sites of deposition and resorption the entire growing mandible in general follows an expanding v principle especially at the posterior border which ultimately results in increased interramal distance So with the displacement of the ramus posteriorly the area once occupied by the ramal bone now converts to the posterior part of the body of mandible the growing dentition acts as a stimulus in response to which the growth of alveolar process takes place it is the increased growth of the alveolus which ultimately contributes to the height of the mandibular body so the curve in which the alveolus grows is not just upward but also outwards in order to accommodate the larger permanent teeth and apart from this the mental foramen does not show much change after the 6th year of life with the advancing age the chin tends to become more prominent as a result of combined resorption in the alveolar region below the lower incisor and the increased deposition which takes place at the mental protuberance as discussed previously on the buccal side resorption on the anterior posterior part and deposition on the posterior inferior region can be seen at the area of angle and the opposite pattern is seen on the lingual side on observing the lingual surface of the mandible one can easily make out a large resorption field in form of lingual fossa with a prominent deposition field that is lingual tuberosity lying above it now let's talk about the condyle So the growth in condyle of the mandible is endochondral in nature. It has been identified as a secondary cartilage in terms of its appearance and growth capacity. Since the cartilage on condyle covers the ends of the bone where they articulate with each other similar to a knee joint, it is a type of articular cartilage which in turn is hyaline in nature. Now you may also wonder how the condyle of mandible is different from the articular cartilage elsewhere in the body. So here's an explanation. 
by the simplified histological diagram you can make out that the initial three layers namely the bone the prechondroblast and the chondroblast are common however there is a unique difference observed in no other articular cartilage of the body which is the presence of a dense and thick fibrous connective tissue layer therefore the growth in condyle is unique because in the deepest layer similar to the long bone the hyaline cartilage provides the interstitial growth which lengthens it but also beneath the connective tissue covering there occurs increase in thickness because of the appositional growth now let's discuss the eight changes in mandible so at birth the mental foramen lies near the lower border of the mandible while in adults it is between the upper and lower borders and in case of old age because of the loss of alveolus and the dentition the mental foramen comes to lie near the upper border talking about the angle of the mandible at birth it is obtuse near 180 degree then the angle reduces to right angle in adults that is around 90 degree because of the action of the developing masticatory muscles and it again it becomes obtuse at old age near 140 degrees now talking about the level of the coronoid and the condylar processes at birth or in an infant you will see that the coronoid process is larger and it lies above the level of the condylar process and this is opposite in case of adults and in old age so you will see in adults that the condylar process is above the level of coronoid process in old age it is similar but the only difference is that we can observe the coronoid process is bent backwards talking about the mandibular canal at birth it lies above the level of the mylohyoid line in adults it almost runs parallel with the mylohyoid line but in old age it comes to lie near the upper alveolar border then the symphysis menti as i mentioned previously the mandibular bone is present in two halves at the case of an infant so therefore the symphysis menti is present in at birth in adults it is represented only by a faint ridge that also in the upper part and in the old age it is almost unrecognizable so this is a summary of postnatal growth of mandible so you can pause the video take a screenshot and absorb and recollect the points we have already discussed so that was all for today's session if you have any doubts any queries or any suggestions for the upcoming video you can drop your comments in the comment section below